Welcome to the Wednesday interview from the Sustainable Futures Report. I'm Anthony Day, and it's Wednesday the 17th of November 2021. The circular economy optimises the use of global resources and minimises pollution, but the success of the concept depends on how much use is obtained from each product and how rapidly each product is returned for recycling. Today, I'm talking to Matthias Axelsson about his concept of the oval economy. The Sustainable Futures Report addresses three key issues. The climate emergency, resource shortage and pollution. The climate emergency is no secret to anybody these days, not at the moment with COP26 going on in Glasgow and all sorts of reports across the papers. As far as resources is concerned, as far as resources are concerned, it's a question of what we need, what we need to take from nature for everything we eat, use or wear. And as far as pollution is concerned, well, we're well aware of litter and plastic, but there are the more subtle pollutants which leach into our watercourses, affect wildlife and habitats, and of course, things gases which escape into the atmosphere. Bound up with all that is the idea of the circular economy. But let's start off by talking about where most of us are at the moment, which is the linear economy, which means we take, make and dispose. We take resources that we need from the earth to produce what we need to eat, use or wear. And then we just throw it away when we finish with it. And then we start again by taking more from nature and manufacturing it. Now, the idea of the circular economy, we all know about reduce, reuse, recycle, but the circular economy goes further. It says reduce, reuse, refurbish, remanufacture, repair. And finally, if you can't repurpose it as the thing falls to pieces, you then take it down into its component parts and you put them back into the process. So ultimately, if you've got a perfect circular economy, You've got no waste. And then there's the oval economy. My guest today is Matthias Axelsson, who is a doctor of business and a researcher at the Stockholm School of Economics in Sweden. Matthias, welcome. Thank you very much. Your idea then is the oval economy. Can you explain a bit more about how that works and what that is? Uh, thank you for your introduction. Um, the idea of the oval economy it was developed uh, together. I would develop it together with Eric Hoss, who, who is a glaciologist, and he's. Uh, we were talking about the sort of the time problem with the circle economy. Uh, the, if conceptually, you could have a circular economy uh, and run it quite fast. So you could sort of recycle in the different steps that you mentioned um, in, 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 a, in a quite a short time, if you like. And that's conceptually a problem because if we're really going to address what you mentioned uh, uh, with the sort of the resource problems. If we're going to really reduce the CO2 emissions, etc., we need to slow down the usage of materials and thereby products. And based on that, we developed the, the concept of oval business models instead, basically arguing the same things as a sort of the circular, but putting emphasis on the time, slowing down the use. And, and that have quite fundamental business implications uh, because it means that we need to very put focus on the design of the products, making sure that they can last for a very long time. That means that, and then after repair, etc., um, uh, uh, in accordance as, uh, of the concept of, of circle business models, but focusing on, on sort of keeping the products in use for a longer time um, have fundamental implications for the current business models of uh, companies. So what we would like to achieve with this concept is to make companies realize if they're gonna be really serious to go green for real, 
they cannot really say that, you know, we have a circle of business models and then, then running it at, at a high speed. Uh, it means that you need to sort of actually sell uh, in the, down the road, sell less products because you sort of, the, because the customers will not demand new to the extent uh, that they do if you sort of have, have faster uh, circles, so to speak. Okay, well, this, this sounds a bit like an ideal, but I think if you have a totally integrated, a vertically integrated organization, mm. which is in control of every stage from actually uh, yeah. obtaining the raw materials and processing it and taking it through to market, that's fine. But surely the majority of organizations are just one link in the chain and they cannot insist on a circular economy because they don't control enough of the economy. So how are we going to bring these changes about? I think that uh, what you're addressing is absolutely correct. And that goes for most companies that they can neither go for a circular or uh, overall economy. It is the end manufacturer and producer uh, selling to the end consumer that can do it. Automotive manufacturers, uh, fashion companies selling to, to consumers. Those are the ones who can sort of start implementing this. Uh, and yes, it might sound like an ideal, but what we would like sort of to provoke seriously is the realization that um, if we're going to deal with the environmental challenges, not the least the climate crisis, seriously, uh, business models will have to change fundamentally. And we could argue conceptually that uh, a, a business model of the future will be in, in some ways timeless conceptually. Right. You will produce products for eternity of course not in in practice but with, with that idea they should your refrigerator should not be renewed in five years ten years you should keep it for 20 30 years perhaps and i do understand that that means that we as consumers need to change our ideals too but that surely is the most important point it's changing consumer attitudes because consumers want a new car every three years they want a new kitchen they want a new television yeah they want I... a new phone how are we going to change that? Because that's become the norm, uh, probably relatively recently, but everybody is yeah. a consumer. Absolutely, that's correct. It has become the norm. Uh, and uh, But I think responsible companies need at least to start innovating the business models that are alternatives. So we as consumers can at least choose, the overall, go for the overall solution key buying a refrigerator that is designed to last, having the service package that you can sort of repair it once it's broken. Today, that is hard an option for many products. You just have to get rid of it uh, and buy a new one. So, so you need to start, if you're a responsible company, if you sort of are, are taking these things serious about climate change, you need to start having the alternatives. And then hopefully, we as consumers will follow. And I think the younger generation is a hope when it comes to that. Um, and, and, and we can also obviously work with incentives, uh, the, the taxes, the sort of how politics, the, the policies that influence how sort of the markets are functioning can also play a role here. But we need to start to think differently and then start acting differently. And th th that is sort of why we introduce this con concept of overall um, uh, business models as a way to push the thinking and thereby the actions. Just to say that there's no way we can sort of stay in the models because we see too much of like incremental efforts to deal with the, the climate crisis. It's trying to sort of stick in the old business models and doing some adjustments uh, instead of realizing that we fundamentally need to change. Right. Now, you're talking about this as an element in addressing the climate crisis. When I started off, I said, look, we've got to look at resources, we've got to look at pollution. Of course, thinking about it, if you recycle, in general, the only thing that you can recycle is the material which was embodied in the original product. But you can't recover and recycle the energy that went into the manufacture, nor can you recover and recycle the human effort that went into yep. it. Correct. So uh, from that point of view, if you are slowing down the uh, recycling cycle, if you like, then you are using less energy and you are creating less emissions. 
Is that the way you see it? Yeah, correct. Right. Well, the question comes back, who's driving this? Is it business? Is it government? Is it the consumer? But the thing is that businesses really, well, some would say they exist to um, uh, for the benefit of their shareholders. Others would say that they should or may, maybe do exist for the benefit of consumers. Governments do what consumers will vote for, which may not be a good thing for the planet or anything else. So how do we change these attitudes? Where do we start? Do we start with government? Do we start with business? Well, but if we start with uh, consumers, how do we do it? There's a great big industry, advertising industry, which is reinforcing existing expectations. What are you going to do? Yeah, that's the question, right? What are we <laughs> going to do? <laughs> I think we need to address it from, from a range of different perspectives, obviously. Um, I, I think there is some companies have start becoming serious about this. So I, 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 I am hopeful that we will see more experimentation with real uh, oval business models uh, in the forthcoming years. I, I do hope, and there is hope for, for policy going in the right direction, um, although it's too little, too late and too slow, sure, for sure. But I, I think it's better to be hopeful here than, than sort of just giving up. Um, on the individual level, um, I think there are, as I mentioned, in particular among, among the young consumers, uh, a demand for, for actually taking responsibility with your wallet. What you buy makes a difference. Uh, and, and you need to start somewhere. So, so I think there are positive signs uh, on all these, both the sort of the policy level, the company level, and the individual level. And I, I the, sort of what, what I hear when I meet business leaders is that they see it's more about, this is about competition. Uh, you don't want to bet on a, on a business model that would be more of the same as in the, or, or on what you have today. You need to find the new uh, solutions, whatever they are. But they're, they're, they're struggling, uh, obviously, and there is not an easy journey ahead. But I do believe that th there are positive signs going in the right direction. Um, and okay. may, is it fast enough? Well, um, we'll see. Well, we'll see, yes. Uh, if it's not fast enough, I'm not looking forward to seeing. Um, uh, no. Th there, are, there are the start, there is the start of some sort of regulation uh, insofar as we have things like the emissions trading schemes. So organizations do have an obligation to cut their carbon emissions because they suffer financial penalties if they don't. You could argue that the price is not high enough and it doesn't really work, but it is it is a start. It's a start, I think, of what we talk about as the transition, the transition from business as usual towards the low carbon economy. Now, you've identified a number of challenges that a number of different sorts of businesses actually face in facing up to the transition. Tell us a bit more about that. Well, I think there are different challenges and you can start on addressing them on different levels. But first of all, you have a cognitive uh, challenge. Uh, and that is that we are sort of locked in in our thinking and our, in the way we are acting uh, based on what was relevant in the past. Uh, that is, the, and that's the limitation. So you start need to sort of be humble and recognize that we probably don't have the thinking that is uh, will take us to the future. So you need to start to, to address that and get the help from uh, other external perspectives to so listen to the young ones, etc. To to sort of really open up. And just by assuming that what we're doing today and the business models that we have today will not be the ones that will make us competitive and successful tomorrow, it's a good starting point. That, that is sort of where, where I think you need to start. But then you obviously have the whole challenges of, of the, all the KPIs, what you're measuring today and your financial targets, how you allocate capital, all those things. You need to assume that that might not be the, the sort of the story of tomorrow either. And that means that you need to sort of in parallel with going for, for 
sort of as of today, still being there and trying to moderate and, and improve the, the your existing model, model, business model, you need to sort of start exploring the new ones and being open for different ways of measuring, different ways of, of financing, and perhaps ultimately for, for other financial sort of metrics and of different ways of, of leading too. And that's a huge challenge. And many companies are obviously not equipped for that, but that is not the same as saying that they cannot be equipped for that. As they in, in, when they start realizing that the sort of the name of the game is changing. And uh, so, so that's where we are. This is transition period. And I think some companies will take that leap to the future and make the necessary transitions. Others will sort of go out of business. Does that mean also that we need to involve the educational system so that people come out of education with a broader understanding of the challenges and changes which need to be made? Yeah, but that would be probably be too slow, right? If you sort of, yes, we need to educate the young ones, but they would be in positions to make strategic decisions in some decades from now, and then it would be too late. So we need to start educating the top executives today. The ones who sort of, it's, it's, it's like, if we are in a crisis, you cannot so go looking for, I wish I had another crew. You have the crew that you have. Yeah. You need to start, you know, cultivating them and, and, and helping them. Because, they, I mean, they, they, it, most people would lo- prefer do, ha- having a positive impact and doing a good job also for society, if you really ask them. I mean, we are all humans, uh, but they don't have the recipes and the necessary sort of the tools for, for thinking and acting. So, so but, but education, yeah, as, as a wide term, I think, I think uh, that's, um, it, it, that is necessary and it's also hopeful because it's, it can help us finding new ways. So do we need the governments to take a lead? Do we need them to bring in regulations, <laughs> for example, to strengthen the audit regulations? The audit regulations at the moment are basically looking at financial probity. Do we need to say that you have a statutory duty for your organization to be tested on its environmental um, probity, if you like? It's easy to say yes to that, the way you phrase it. But I know that it's super difficult in practice on the how level. But sure, government has a a critical role and... uh, and not the least in the, in, the, in the European Union on the EU level, I mean, the EU taxonomy, et cetera, is, is, is probably an important step in, in that direction. Because if, if you sort of have a cost on the, on the capital cost, the financing the, your business, if that is related to the, the sort of the negative or positive impact on the external environment, um, that will start driving things in the directions that are hopeful. Uh, hopefully uh, hopeful good good well as we draw this conversation to a close cop 26 the big environmental (coughs) conference in glasgow is also coming to the end of its second week from what you've learned so far uh, are you optimistic have you heard of any things coming out of it which are useful which uh, uh, allow you to take an optimistic view i i i mean this was this discussion about the coal, uh, positive, um, the, what was presented last week regarding forests in the world, that was a positive sign for sure. Uh, so yes, there are signs, uh, indications that we could be hopeful, but um, I, I don't know. I, I would rather wait and, and, and see, uh, but, but to see what comes out of it uh, when it closes. Um, uh, I, I, I do hope, of course, as most people do, that, the, the, that uh, politics will step up uh, and make the t- tough, necessary decisions. Because if you take it from the business perspective, business leaders prefer to have sort of the, 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 the rules just set. So you know what, what, sort of the, the rules for competition, basically. And then you can start acting on that. And that, and also it will stimulate innovation. And, and that innovation is the key if we're going to solve this. Um, 
So, so yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, but you know, uh, let's let's see. Right. Well, Greta Thunberg has already said that COP26 has failed. Let's hope that on this occasion, she's wrong. Yes, definitely. Matthias Axelsson, thank you very much for your for, for, for your ideas and for sharing them with the Sustainable Futures Report. That's been very interesting. Thank you for having me. Matthias Axelsson of the Stockholm School of Economics. There will be another interview next Wednesday and another episode of the Sustainable Futures Report on Friday. Contents unknown at this stage, but probably something about COP26, as the dust settles and everyone argues about whether it was a triumph or another failure. If you like the Sustainable Futures Report, please subscribe via the website so you don't miss an issue. You could also help support the podcast by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash SFR. Your support is invaluable, and I'm especially grateful to all my existing patrons who make a contribution to cover hosting, research and other costs. That was the Wednesday interview from the Sustainable Futures Report. I'm Anthony Day. Until next time. Thank you.